special music today, I'd like to share this verse with you, uh, which goes along with the words of the song. It's taken from John chapter 14, verse 27. The Lord says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I hope you'll be blessed as you reflect on these words. When he opened the, the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. May God add his blessings to this reading. us into context of this passage, that it is with opening of the scroll. It's not just a seal by itself out there, but it's when the scroll is open that we experience this strange silence. I mentioned earlier that our pioneers did not anticipate that the church they organized 150 years ago would still be here in 2013. And I tell you, if someone would tell them that the church they're organizing there in Battle Creek, Michigan, in 1863 would still be on earth, there would be probably deadening silence among them. Have you ever reflected on what this silence means in Revelation chapter 8? We journey through the book of Revelations, and there are these seven seals on the scroll. And the scroll is important. The whole book of Revelation seems to reflect on this question, what is in that scroll? And when the first four seals pop, John hears things happening on earth. When the last two seals, he not only hears, he sees things. But then when the seventh seal is broken, all of a sudden, there is silence. 
And that silence occurs exclusively in heaven. It's not on earth. It's a silence in heaven. What does it mean? Through the years, there's been all kinds of interpretations. I picked up a book by William Sheldon, an early Adventist pioneer who wrote in 1866. And he speculates that maybe that silence is because God finally let those angels that are holding the winds of strife go. And as they cause this huge devastation on planet Earth, there's indignation of heaven of what we humans produce. There's that thought. Then there was another Adventist leader, Emil Andreessen, who took that step further and suggested, you know what? Maybe the silence is in heaven because God is not answering anymore anybody's prayers. And so he developed this theology called Last Generation Theology, which suggests that there will be time when all hell break loose, when there will be no more mercy, though no probation closes, and those of us who made peace with Jesus would have to stand on our own without mediator. And some of you waving your heads because you've heard that. Now, I used the word speculation at the beginning because people were wondering, what is that silence in heaven? What does it mean? Martin Luther, he wondered and he called that silence as dark night of the soul, God's hiddenness. Have you ever felt like God is silent? You've got answer, questions and he is silent. You want to bang your head on whatever is close by and yet there is no answer. I always wonder how these uh, Sabbath school lessons almost coincide. When I planned for this sermon a month ago, I didn't know what the lesson would be on today. And as we study Habakkuk, it, it's so important to realize that Habakkuk struggled with that, with, with God and the questions he had. And so Martin Luther suggested that maybe the silence in heaven is the dark night of the soul when God is not answering. One Bible commentator suggests a cover-up conspiracy. Because he refers to a specific translation, it's a Sahidic translation that says, they held their mouth, suggesting that it's actively produced silence. As if someone in charge in heaven hit the mute button. And all of a sudden, when the seventh seal is broken, John wants to know what's up, but days of silent television. He can't hear, it's, it's a silence. Is this what's really there? Now, Eugene Peterson, some of you are familiar with his paraphrase of the Message Bible, he connects this silence with what follows after. Because see, right after in Revelation chapter 8, from verse 2 and on, there's a temple scene. And in that temple scene, the priest literally comes to the altar of burnt offering, and he reaches to the most hot place with a long frying pan, we call it sensor, you know, good name. But literally, it looked like a big shovel, a frying pan, with a long handle. And so he reaches there in the fire, pulls out the hottest coals, and then walks with that into the holy place. And on the way to the holy place, other priests would put incense in that frying pan. And so he brings it to the altar of incense, where he burns incense. And during that time, there is silence. Because it represents prayers. And so Eugene Peterson suggests that maybe the silence in heaven is symbolizing that the whole heaven is so attentive that God listens to our prayers. Now that is important. Sometimes I wonder if we're capable of silence. Sometimes I wonder if in this church we would be capable to sit for 30 seconds silently. Because you know, the whole heaven is Silent, And I, I wonder if it's possible for us to sit in silent meditation and reflect. So Eugene Peterson uh, produces this awesome devotional reflecting on this silence in heaven. You know, we're yelled at, called on, harassed, and sometimes we wish for a moment of silence. Have you been there? The older we get, the more silence I want. And you listen to those teenagers... And I want just silence. 
Now, some of you may never experience a conversation of really paying attention to what people got to say and silently sitting and listening. Some of us probably the only conversations we had were always elevated tone of voice with people buzzing all around. If that's so, re-examine your relationships. Because it's important sometimes to be in silence. It's important for a moment of silence. God hears our prayers. But that's still a speculation. Because that segment deals with the trumpets to come. Verse 1 of Silence of Heaven has none to do with verse 2 and on. See, priest, after he would offer the prayers, he would come out and he would literally throw those coals on the ground. And he would do so loudly, he would literally hit the floor of the temple with that shovel. And that banging noise of censer being thrown to the floor was a signal for trumpets to blow. And so that vision in Revelation precedes the seven trumpets. By the way, the chapters and verses, the vision, was not how John intended. That's something produced much later in the 16th century. So that section was written without those connections. I want you to zoom in just in verse 1, one verse there. Silence in heaven for half an hour. Imagine yourself in John's place. After moving visions, thunderous explosions, all kinds of things happening when those seals were often, all of a sudden, there is a silence. Now, I would be expecting fanfare. I would be expecting some triumphal ending to all the things that were happening, not the silence. Do you like the silence? Maybe God is giving him a little break that he could reflect on everything he saw and try to understand. Now, I heard people sometimes insist that, you know, see, if the heaven was silent, then we have to be silent on earth. And you read today in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 20. It says, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be what? Silent. silent. And some, you probably still remember the days when the congregation would sing that song. And everybody would be silent. And the platform party would come and take their places. And there was that silence. But this passage in Habakkuk speaks about silence where? Habakkuk. Revelation speaks of heaven, but Habakkuk says, let all the earth be silent. So these are different things. You cannot superimpose these things. And I tell you, sometimes it's important for the earth to be silent to notice what God is up to. And that's exactly the context of Habakkuk. Habakkuk is calling people to attention that we would see what God is doing. May I suggest that in the Old Testament there are two other passages that give us hint what's this all about. Zephaniah says, hold silent before God. For the day of the Lord is at hand. So what is the silence connected here with? I heard that. God's coming. For the day of the Lord is at hand. And then Zechariah 2.13 writes, Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord. For he is raised up and out of his holy temple. What does it remind you now? Why do you think heaven is silent? Could it be that all that praise and worship that took place in heaven is interrupted by something significant? God himself got up and got out of his holy habitation. Because the day of the Lord is at hand. This passage gives us more than a hint. Now remember, the book of Revelation has seven series of sevens. There are seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets. Remember those things. And these are parallels. They're not one after another. They're paralleling the history from different perspectives. And so when we read the seventh trumpet, which we haven't got to, it says the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of Christ, and he shall reign forever. So seventh trumpet said that when the seventh trumpet blows, all the kingdoms now belong to who? To Christ. The seventh church message was, here I stand and knock. But in the seventh seal, all John experiences is this Silence in heaven. 
silence in heaven is really unusual. May I suggest that the heaven is silent because the word is absent. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. And who are we speaking here about this word? Christ. And see, Christ is a coming to earth to pick up his people. And when he's coming to earth, do you know who's surrounding him? Angels. How many angels? All of them. Now, if you don't believe it, open Matthew, Gospel of Matthew. And these are the words of Jesus himself. Matthew 25, verse 31. Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. How many angels are coming with Christ? So who's left in the temple? None. There is no need for worship to continue up there because Christ is coming down. And He's coming not just with a small group. Not just with those who sung to the shepherds and guided the wise men. But he's coming literally with the whole heaven in the train of his glory. That's the Bible. That escort is incredible. All the heavenly angels. I'm excited about it because, see, the name Adventist reminds me that my identity is connected to that faith. That I'm not here to make my life better. But I can't wait for Jesus to come. And he's going to come in all his glory with all his angels. There's nothing more important in the world than the second coming of Lord Jesus Christ. There's no political event, no sporting event, no nothing more important than second coming of Jesus. Now consider your life. Are you excited about that? How excited are you about that? I am excited, but You're saying you're very excited. Does your life reflect that? Because see, almost 170 years ago, there are a group of people who are so excited that Jesus is coming, they're willing to give everything up. They're called Millerites. They're willing to give everything up. And I tell you, I noticed that at the end of every century, there is more excitement. Do you remember Y2K? I'd never forget the experience of baptizing someone, literally, in the last hours of 1999, December 31st, 1999, someone wanted to get baptized. We had a tank filled because the Y2K was coming. And yet these are human standards. We don't know when Jesus comes. His coming will catch us by surprise. But see, Adventist is because we believe that eventually He will come. We don't know when, but He will come. But then there's this silence. It's not just momentary silence. John actually says that silence in heaven is for how long? Half hour. Now, could it be that John just kind of lost track of time and, and he was so puzzled with the silence that he wasn't sure? Or could it be that that half an hour is significant? Let me suggest something. I, I first learned that when I was a young boy. There was a preacher in my town by name Piotr Shulha. He was a good friend of my father. He was a bit older. They worked together. And he had one passion, Daniel and Revelation. And as teenagers, we knew him because of that. And see, when you consider half an hour in prophetic time, now you're familiar with the biblical concept day for a year? One day is equals a year. Day for a year, biblical concept. So... How many hours in a day? 24. How many months in a year? 12. Do the math. One hour is how long here? Okay, let's try it again. I purposely did not put any things on the screen. I could have done math for you. I want to make sure you're awake. One day has 24 hours, so you have 24. One year has 12 months. Divide. 12 by 24. 15 days. So one hour is 15 days or half a month. So what is half an hour? Divided by two is one week. 
See, biblically, half an hour is one week period. Track with me here. Biblically, half an hour is one week from our earth perspective. So if you put these two together, then you know what? Jesus coming would not be fly-by-night rapture. Jesus coming would not that be, you know, drive-by shooting, just, just happen and you didn't see it. Jesus coming, he'll take his time. Now, as, as a teenager, when I heard that preaching for the first time, I got excited. Because I grew up in a country where they ridiculed me for my faith. See, Soviet Union was a communist country. And anyone who believed in God was a stupid idiot. And so as a kid, when I realized that, I said, this is awesome. Imagine this. Jesus are coming. And I've got a whole week to tell these idiots. See now who's laughing? <laughs> now, I know this is not in Jesus' spirit, right? But imagine the revenge you get. You were persecuted. You were harassed. And now Jesus takes his time. He's coming with all his holy angels. All heaven is escorting him to earth, and he's taking his time. I remember that preacher. It's vivid because I took notes. I was age of these teenagers, and my boys know that. It's sitting on my bookshelf. I have two, um, one of those diary kind of books with, you know, 300 pages, written in cursive. Because as he taught us Daniel and Revelation, we as teenagers sat and listened and took copious notes. And I took those notes, they're sitting on that bookshelf, and, and I looked through that. And I remember him telling us that, you know what? Even workers who are on a shift somewhere in Australia, in the mines, or in Chile, in Chile, those Chilean miners, they will have time to get up to the surface to see. There would be no one who would say, I missed it, I didn't see. For a week, the earth will spin seven times, Jesus is coming. There would be no need for TV report, you know. I'm in Australia and I can't see, but I'm watching on CNN or whatever Australian television stations there are. Jesus is coming and they see him in Canada. No, for seven days, for a whole week, Jesus is coming, approaching. Now, when I consider all the prophecies in Revelation, you know, it would be enough time for the puzzled humanity to maybe even orchestrate a nuclear missile attack on the second coming of Christ. Now, we're talking history now. We, we haven't moved to the future prophecies yet, but we'll do that when we consider trumpets and plagues and other things. There's evidence in the book of Revelation that humanity will mount an assault on second coming of Christ. And I may be speculating here, but when you consider all these movies coming out about how brave earthlings fight all the aliens invading earth, you know, it's there in our mind. You would see that cloud. And people who don't believe in Christ say, Jesus? Aliens! Let's summon the armies of this world and let's set the target. Jesus is coming. But you know, it's also significant to me because my name is not just Adventist. There are many Adventists out there. My name is Seventh-day Adventist. And to me, there's a connection that, see, at the beginning, there was a silence. There was nothing. And then there was word. And God created this earth in six days and rested on seven. There was a week of creation before. And you know what? When he's coming, he's going to take his time. What a week that would be. I wonder if his coming would happen on Sabbath. I don't want to get all emotional about it. But I wonder if it's truly so. And there is that week of coming. Imagine that glorious week from Sabbath to Sabbath. Knowing that our Jesus is coming. Those who rejected would cry to the rocks, follow us, hide us. Those who have no relationship with Jesus, that would be painful, torturing, weak. I learned this, and I learned that it's not my duty to laugh at those who do not accept, but my heart should turn with compassion of Jesus for those who do not know him. See, that scroll that was open when the seventh seal was ripped and there was a silence in heaven. Many people speculate what's in that scroll. But when you consider the context, you realize that in that scroll is a promise of Jesus coming. 
promise of redemption. God wants to come to redeem his own. Human history will finish as it began. With God's presence. With God's word and God's spirit here guiding us. How fresh is your faith? How excited are you? Are you excited for more than just yourself? Do you consider your family? Do you consider your kids, your neighbors, the next generation? Because see, we don't know when that will happen. We'll know for sure it will happen. Are we ready? Our pioneers used to sing that song, lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. I wonder if we sing frequently enough that song to remind us that Jesus is coming again. We could speculate about things and time and things like that, but all I know, He is coming. And every eye shall see Him. And it's that moment that I'm waiting for. Are you ready, church? As we sing this short song, Jesus is coming again. Reflect on the spirit of our pioneers. When the youth led today, I kind of wish that they would read their history and know. Because that hymn, 602, A Brother Be Faithful, that we sung, was written by a 24-year-old Uriah Smith. Now picture a 24-year-old. They're missing from this church mostly. Our pioneers were young people. In 1844, Ellen was only 16. Uriah Smith was only 13. They were young teenagers, young adults, who studied the Bible because they were passionate about Jesus coming. And the songs we sing, they wrote because they wanted people's feet to move toward heaven. That a brother be faithful was one of the favorite of our pioneers. And people who remember Ellen White, they said that she loved that song she would actually tap along that song because say, I love the songs that move people. So when we sing, lift up the trumpet. Sing about that blessed hope that we have in second coming of Jesus. Please stand. As we reflect on the message that was given to us today, let us be ready for your coming. Let us all proclaim your salvation. We ask you to be with us as we travel home from this place. 
And we ask you to be with those that could not be with us today. And we ask you to give those that are requiring it healing mercies. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Hello? Okay. Um, I have a second reading of um, a patient. Uh, patient. <laughs> I'm still a nurse, obviously. Um, uh, Vieng Chantelante would like to join our fa church family by proclamation of faith. Is Vieng here? Yeah. Uh, Vieng is there she here. is over there. Okay. Um, I would uh, like to make a motion that we accept uh, Vieng into our church. May I have? Second, lots of them, okay. Thank, Thank you, you Janice, for remembering this. I wasn't <laughs> here for the first reading. Just to share with you, um, Vien, you, you know Vien, right? May, the rest of you take a seat for now, for a second. Uh, I just want her to just stand for a second so people would know who Vien is. She started study over a year, right? And she studied with a number of people, but the last segment she studied together with Violet Intring. And I continued with her, and so she's been baptized by full immersion in a Baptist church. But as she learned more truth, she wants to join this church family by profession of faith. And so you've heard the second reading presented by Janice. All in favor? Thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations, Vian. Thank you.